Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for the last virtual media briefing about COVID-19 in London and Middlesex County for 2020. We're happy to be joined this afternoon by the Mayor of London, Ed Holder, the Warden of Middlesex County, Kathy burkhart Jessen, the Associate Medical Officer of Health at the Middlesex London Health Unit, Dr. Alex Summers, and the Medical Director at LHSC, Dr. Adam Ducolo. And we're happy to be joined by the media who are in attendance this afternoon. And a reminder to submit your questions using the question forum here on Microsoft Teams. Please indicate your name and your media outlet as well as who your question is directed to. And finally, a welcome to those tuning in this afternoon on Global News Radio, AM 980 CFPL. Those watching on the Rogers TV, uh, on Rogers TV rather, as well as the Rogers YouTube channel and Facebook page, and those who are tuning in on the CTV London website. Well, let's get to the opening remarks right away, and we'll start this afternoon with Mayor Ed Holder. Mayor Holder. Well, thank you, Dan, and good afternoon, everyone. 2020, what a year it's been. You know, it's it's almost hard to imagine uh, what pre-COVID uh, feels like. And I've certainly had uh, comments from Londoners uh, across the spectrum and looking for what we used to call the good old days. Um, let me say, though, Londoners can feel very proud of their efforts. Um, you know, what uh, what everyone did, uh, with very few exceptions, was nothing short of amazing to this point. And I want to say thanks to Londoners. Thanks for your efforts. Thanks for trying to stem this, this uh, challenge of COVID. You know, you've heard it all and you'll hear it uh, again and again until we uh, beat this to the ground about uh, watching uh, group get togethers and even now family uh, get togethers, particularly at this time. And uh, the, the self distancing and the masks and the hygiene, things that you all know. But Londoners, thank you very much. Um, to those that uh, uh, skirted the rules, some uh, you'll note as you hear today's numbers that no one's immune. And we, if not we're, if not being sick, we could well be carriers, and uh, we all have to be so, so, so careful. So I'm encouraging you more than ever to be steadfast, be firm in, uh, in, uh, in just ensuring that uh, the safety of all those we love uh, is paramount and uppermost in our thinking. I need to say, as 2020 comes to an end, uh, to thank our frontline workers, to thank our first responders and those uh, now who are providing essential services and remain open. Uh, our heartfelt support goes to those who aren't open and uh, are restricted in many ways or, and or limited to uh, curbside pickup, but we've done this before and we're resilient. We can do this again. So I'm encouraged that, uh, that uh, we'll get through this together with all of your tremendous efforts. I need to thank uh, the health unit, uh, Dr. Summers, you and uh, and Dr. Mackey and your team have been nothing short of amazing. Uh, I thought Dan's done okay too, but I really want to say to all of you uh, at MLHU, thank you so much. Um, Adam, Dr. Ducolo, um, what LHSC has done is nothing short of angels work and uh, your teams have just been great. And the support of the county, uh, uh, I have to say to Kathy Burkhart, Justin, my favorite warden, that uh, uh, this is a team effort. This is, uh, this is not city and county this is us together and together we can get through this but it's going to take the greatest resolve uh, as we work through what we need to do and uh, as we work toward getting the vaccines uh, in uh, in everyone's arms and as I say take a shot for the team and as it becomes very real uh, make sure we all do so with that I want to wish everyone a, a joyful and a blessed uh, 2021 may it be healthy to you and your families and um, again, let's please, let's do this together because together we're stronger, uh, together we're better. Take that shot. Thanks, Dan. Over to uh, you, uh, Warden Kathy. Great, well, thank you so much for those words, um, Mayor Ed. Certainly, I uh, echo the thanks that you um, gave out to the health unit, to LHSC, uh, and to the residents, to the city, to the county, no question. Um, without the hard work and the effort that we've all put into it. Um, I think 2021 could have been a lot worse than perhaps it was. So, but here we are, we're in the week between Christmas and New Year's and during a provincial lockdown, no less. 
this is the week when you don't know what day it is or who you are or what you're supposed to be doing. I have to admit that I was happy to have had this obligation today to give me some sense of routine. I know uh, my uh, yoga pants have gotten a good workout the last few days, so I hope that everyone enjoyed a different Christmas celebration and has found a way to connect to all those important to you. As we prepare to ring in a new year, it is incumbent upon us to respect the lockdown and the restrictions and to stick to home as much as possible. Only visiting essential service stores for groceries or prescriptions. As we are reminded with the daily num uh, numbers, COVID is still here and more so than ever. And while we can debate the restrictions, they are what they are. And if we don't want to live with them longer than 28 days, and if we don't want to overburden our healthcare system, then we must hunker down. New Year celebrations mark the promise of a fresh start, and this year is no different. 2021 is a clean slate. Step forward into it, reflecting on the year that has passed, and as challenging it, uh, it, ha it has been, be thankful for it, for the lessons that were learned and the good times that were experienced. Because I think if you look back, you will see that you did still experience some good times. Be thankful for the coming year and the opportunity to start afresh, to think about what you want to do and achieve. Be thankful that we have the frontline workers that we do. Start 2021 with thanking our healthcare professionals, our truck drivers, our grocery store employees, all of the essential workers that are still going to work day to day to make sure that you have what you need. They are all going above and beyond to make sure and so make sure that you thank them and wish them a happy 2021. As has been highlighted in 2020, we know that life takes us through valleys and it brings us up mountains and I wish for you more mountaintops than valleys. So bring on 2021. I know I'm ready. I think you likely are as well. So respect your physical distancing measures, wash your hands, get tested if you are showing symptoms or have been in contact with a positive case. Mask up and for the time being, stay home. Happy New Year, everyone. Dr. Summers, over to you. Thank you, Madam Warren and uh, Mr. Mayor and uh, uh, happy holidays and uh, an upcoming happy new year to all. Indeed, the holiday season is upon us um, and with it, though, unfortunately, our record level cases of COVID-19 in our community. Uh, as you will have noted from the dashboard today, the MLHU is reporting 100 cases. We've hit triple digits, which was a milestone we were hoping to avoid when it comes to our daily reported case count. We're also reporting one additional new death today. Since the last time that we had a media briefing, our region has exceeded 3,000 cases since the beginning of the pandemic. We've hit additional record days, including 88 cases before the 100 milestone of today. And we are now seeing uh, one to two deaths per day in the last week. We've seen outbreaks, uh, throughout our community in long-term care and retirement homes. Fortunately, those outbreaks continue to be fairly well controlled in most instances. And we are reporting today a large outbreak in an apartment complex here in the city of London. As we approach New Year's and as we approach 2021, it cannot be said enough that the importance of physical distancing, of maintaining close contact only with those with whom you live is absolutely essential. The incident rates that we have seen here locally have skyrocketed over the course of four to six weeks. This is consistent with what is being seen in other parts of the province, but what we know is that without intensive physical distancing efforts by all who are able to do so, we will not be able to slow the rapid acceleration that we are seeing. This lockdown is challenging, it is frustrating, it is not what any of us would have wanted as we embrace 2021, as we celebrate the arrival of the COVID-19 vaccine. However, 
given the numbers that we see, we find ourselves in no position to do anything but. And so certainly as we head into the New Year's Eve season, as we head into New Year's, I really encourage all to make sure that your plans are COVID safe, to make sure that you are staying at home with those with whom you live, ensure that you are not having your conventional New Year's Eve celebrations. That'll be for next year. Thanks again, as always, for joining us and for all your questions. And with that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Ducolo for an update from the hospital. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Summers, uh, Mr. Mayor, Madden Warden, for once again having me today and for your kind words about our uh, exceptional hospital team, both here and at St. Joe's. I couldn't agree more that 2020 has been a team effort with so many partners from all walks of life to, to be where we are today. I do appreciate the opportunity to provide an update on our outbreaks today as we do have a bit of good news. There remains one unit on outbreak at Victoria Hospital with less than five associated patient cases and less than five staff cases. However, I'm pleased to announce that today the four inpatient medicine outbreak at UH has resolved. This marks the resolution of seven weeks of sustained efforts to contain and resolve our outbreaks at UH. UH is now outbreak free. In total, there have been 11 unit level outbreaks at UH since November 10th, with 92 staff and 82 associated patient cases. I want to thank all of the staff and physicians whose tireless efforts and sacrifice over these past several weeks have resulted in today's outbreak free status. With that being said, however, I must acknowledge the tragic impact these outbreaks have had on our patients and the families of those whose, de whose deaths are associated with them. On behalf of LHSC, I extend my deepest condolences to all the families of the 23 patients that have died. I am sorry these outbreaks occurred and I'm sorry for the suffering they have caused. As you know, there were several outbreak control measures impl implemented across LHSC and we will continue to work in partnership with Dr. Summers and his team to determine which members measures will continue and which ones will be lifted. I do wanna stress, although UH is now outbreak free, given the rate of transmission in our community that Dr. Summers is just referring to, LHC does continue to expect a surge in COVID-19 patients in the coming weeks. We are already starting to see the beginnings of that with our recent admission uh, case uh, COVID admissions. We're working collaboratively with regional partners to plan for the impact of this surge uh, and the impact that it will have on services in the on our services in the face of inpatient bed, critical care, and health human resource constraints. We are still working on what those service changes will look like, and we'll share details once they are finalized. LHSC's top priority is to be able to provide high quality health care to our community through a fully functioning and safe hospital working at capacity. Unfortunately, COVID continues to force us to make difficult decisions. We continue to focus on containing and preventing outbreaks, supporting our staff and docs to ensure we can endure the, this ongoing marathon, freeing up 15% of our capacity to prepare, prepare for the surge, and being at the forefront of stopping the virus spread through PPE, public health measures, and most recently vaccine delivery. Lastly, we're planning for the return to regular full operations as soon as possible. I know many of you are probably anxious to hear an update on the vaccinations that are occurring at the Agriplex. They began on December 23rd and our collaboration between the Middlesex London Health Unit, the Southwest Public Health Unit and here on Perth Health Unit and LHSC. There are four to five dozen hospital and health unit staff on site operating that clinic on a daily basis. Before opening the vaccine clinic this morning, we had provided the first dose of the Pfizer vaccine to approximately 500 individuals. Those that are receiving the vaccine right now are primary healthcare workers from long-term care homes and some LHSC team members that have worked in outbreak units. We will vaccinate approximately 300 people today and ramp up our capacity to vaccinate to approximately 200, 420 uh, each day starting tomorrow. We will continue vaccinating through this coming weekend and by Monday, January 4th, we anticipate that we will vaccinate 500 individuals per day. The biggest limitation on how many get vaccinated in the coming weeks will be the amount of vaccine we receive. I too would like to extend LHC's appreciation to our community for its ongoing support of our healthcare heroes and our system in general. We are working to continue to provide high quality patient care in the face of adversity. This has been an exceptionally challenging year for everyone and I remain humbled and inspired by the resilience, strength and commitment of every person who has played a role in the pandemic response. We need our community now to follow the advice and direction Dr. Summers emphasized earlier as we head into 2021. I will add my wishes for a happy, healthy and bright 2021 to our team at LHSC and our entire community. Thank you. Back over to you, Dan. 
Thank you, Dr. Ducalo. Thank you, Dr. Summers, Madam Warden, and Mayor Holder. All right, well, let's get to the questions. We do have a lot in the queue today. Uh, Jennifer Beeman from the London Free Press is first up today, and she's got a question and follow up for Dr. Ducalo. So, first question, Dr. Ducalo, what lessons has LHSC learned from the recent outbreaks? <clears throat> has LHSC made adjustments to its outbreak management practices? Thanks very much, Dan and Jen. Excellent question. Uh, we we learn every day uh, at LHSC and uh, as a quality, you know, fo focus on quality improvement. And there are a number of things we've learned from this outbreak and changes we have made, both within LHSC and in conjunction with uh, Dr. Summers and the health unit. I'll try and highlight a few points. Um, one, we've learned as a potent reminder just how contagious COVID is. Um, it's it been a reminder not only for the staff on the outbreak units, but for everyone on the front lines. And I've had conversations on recent eMERGE shifts uh, with staff that are nowhere, nowhere associated with the outbreak, but have been reminded of, of how, how dangerous COVID is. We've learned uh, to limit staff movement more than we had previously outside of a pandemic. We've learned that diligent auditing uh, and uh, PPE practices and reminding each other on the front lines uh, about, uh, about how to use PPE properly, how important that is. Uh, we've learned, learned that we need to ensure uh, to continue to work with our front lines to understand the constraints they're experiencing. So what is the experience on the front line that's getting in the way uh, of, of a frontline provider's ability to do their job uh, on a regular basis? We've learned about ward rooms, that rooms that hold four patients and work just we very well outside a pandemic uh, have some dangers during a pandemic. And then uh, just one last item, and there's many more, but I'll highlight we, need, we learned that we need to continue to quickly perform contact tracing as quickly as possible when we have a case and then test as quickly as possible as well uh, to help contain the outbreak. Thank you, Dr. Duclo, and, and the follow up from uh, Jen Beeman, and I think you referred to this in your opening remarks, but with the outbreaks uh, largely being cleared up and, and I believe, is, is there one left in one unit? Is that correct or are we all done? There's not at UH, so UH is outbreak free. There's okay. one left in one unit at VIC. Okay, so the question Jennifer has is, is UH resuming any of the temporarily halted services or surgeries with the outbreaks now cleared at UH? Great, great question. So we actually, uh, Monday of last week, went uh, from four operating rooms to seven operating rooms at University Hospital. So we had some resumption of services uh, earlier last week. Uh, we are look, continually reassessing about uh, getting back to normal business as quickly as possible. And right now the unknown or someone unknown is the COVID surge in the community. So any limitations on our uh, schedule activity will be based on the COVID activity and the number of admissions we see in the coming days. Thank you, Dr. Ducalo. Let's go down to a question now from Jacqueline Carbone at Global News Radio AM 980 CFPL. And this is a question for Dr. Summers and for Mayor Holder. And why don't we begin on this one with uh, Dr. Summers and then Mr. Mayor, if you'd like to come in afterwards. Uh, gentlemen, what is your advice to Londoners on ringing in the new year? What should we not be doing? And what are some safe ways people can plan to celebrate the new year? Dr. Summers, you want to start? Uh, thank you for that question, Jacqueline. This New Year's Eve will look very different than any other New Year's Eve. The safest way to celebrate is to do so with those with whom you live. And if reaching out to those who you don't live with, that you're doing so virtually. And that if any interaction is to happen, it is outdoors. No indoor interactions with anybody who is not within your household uh, can be permitted this New Year's. Additionally, if there is an outdoor gathering, the provincial restrictions are very clear. It cannot be larger than 10 people, and I would advise keeping that as small as possible. The best way to celebrate this New Year's Eve is to think about what 2021 will look like when we are celebrating its end at the 12 month mark from now. That will require us coming together by staying apart, anticipating the arrival of the vaccine, and remembering what has allowed for us to make it this far through this pandemic, which is keeping our distance. So indeed, it will be a New Year's Eve that will be very different. Our hope is that we aren't seeing cars on the road, that we aren't seeing uh, groups of people gathering in living rooms or in uh, dining rooms, that this is really um, going to be a, a time spent with those with whom you live. Over to you, Mr. Mayor. Thanks very much. I actually have uh, some uh, insight into this because 
for some 13 years. I co-chaired Rock and New Year's Eve at Vic Park, and it was always alive and a uh, uh, great uh, show with family entertainment and uh, right up to big kids entertainment fireworks uh, off the top of City Hall, both at nine o'clock for the young people and uh, and uh, at midnight for the less young. And uh, and and so I've been in touch with the committee, uh, you know, since the time that I was active in it. Uh, Mr. Plowright's been exceptionally involved in it. I want to give him a shout out for doing what he's doing. Um, and I would tell you that uh, that there will be a rock in New Year's this year. However, it will be virtual. So we'll be streaming the entertainment, which will be organized at different sites. My friend Mario, who uh, uh, is closely associated with London Music Hall, um, is uh, very active with this as well. And there's going to be entertainment, uh, but it will be uh, streamed in. And all the comments that uh, that Dr. Summers has made are, are absolutely correct. So we're trying to bring you some sense of the spirit of it. It will not be at the band show. Uh, the fireworks will not be off the top of City Hall, but it will be virtual and we will ask you to enjoy it as best you can. And and uh, Dan, do you mind if I just do one more shout out if I can? And I appreciated that question very much. Um, you know, when I did my thanks, there were two uh, two groups that I really wanted to acknowledge as well. And uh, we've had a city staff uh, that has just done yeoman's work. Uh, throughout the pandemic, and I can't say enough about the incredible work that, uh, that and leadership that they have shown through our city manager, Lynn Livingston, and a great team uh, that meets quite regularly. In fact, even this morning we met and Dr. Summers was on that call. Uh, and the second is the Sport Council. You know, when uh, the Middlesex London Health Unit said we need uh, uh, we need to put some uh, teeth into masking and they put their own bylaw in, we came in right behind it and supported their efforts. Uh, with uh, with the masking uh, by law, and that's because of a, a, of a city council that gets it. So for all the agencies from transit to hydro to uh, all those who really make things work, uh, I have to say thank you to them, but to council, to staff in particular, I just wanted to add that from my opening comments that uh, was on page three and I, and I didn't quite get there. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. And, uh... Words that are appreciated, I'm sure, by uh, by staff at City Hall and council members as well. Thank you, and thank you, Dr. Summers. Uh, Jane Sims is next up from the London Free Press. I am going to look to Dr. Summers and Dr. Ducolo on this one. Has there been any evidence here of the new COVID-19 variant that's been found in the UK? Thanks for that question, Jane. Uh, we do not, at this point, have evidence of the UK variant in the Middlesex and London region. Uh, as we heard over the last couple of days, it has been identified here in Ontario in the GTA. Um, however, we have not received any word that any of the uh, viral results which have been sampled here in our region and sequenced um, are consistent with that UK virus. Part of our ongoing investigation uh, for each and every case is to assess the potential for travel, of course, and any travel associated with the United Kingdom is being flagged for the laboratory to ensure that sequencing of that virus will happen. Um, however, at this point in time, we have not uh, heard word of that strain present in our community. All right. Anything to add, Dr. Ducolo? All right. No, nothing to add. All right, let's move on. Uh, Jen Beeman is back with a couple of questions. Uh, this one is for Dr. Summers. Does the health unit have an idea of what may have contributed to the spread at Maple Ridge on the park? And this is related to the outbreak in the apartment complex that you mentioned right off the top, Dr. Summers. Thanks, Jen, for the question. We're still investigating uh, why we have seen uh, such transmission in this area. It is most likely it is going to be a combination of many things, including um, the gathering of people potentially with family and friends that may live in the building. Uh, we also know that certain neighborhoods and communities in our regions have slightly higher rates of COVID-19 than others, and it's possible that this uh, apartment complex just happens to be a subsegment of a population that has been impacted more than others. The investigation is ongoing. Additional outbreak measures are in place at this apartment complex, and we will continue to support those 
uh, who are uh, impacted, of course, by the outbreak. The key thing at the moment is that anyone with symptoms in this apartment complex, of course, anyone with symptoms consistent with COVID-19 in our region must immediately self-isolate and pursue testing as quickly as possible so that we can rapidly identify cases and quarantine their contacts. One of the challenges that we are facing right now is that given the amount of transmission that is happening within our region, the probability of being infected despite potentially following all the rules begins to go up. And so if you do have symptoms of COVID-19, do not be ashamed. Do not feel as though we will be judging you when we call you. And if you become a case of COVID-19, you will receive nothing but support from the health unit. This virus is a wily one. It is a frustrating one. It is a persistent one. Frankly, it's a pain in the butt. We continue to work with it and we continue to learn from it. And so if you come down with symptoms, go and get tested. Do it for yourself, do it for your neighbors, do it for your family, do it for your friends. It's a civic duty and we ask you to do so and we thank you for it. Back to you, Dan. Thank you, Dr. Summers. Uh, another question along those lines from Kate Dubinsky at CBC London about the apartment buildings. How much do we know about how this outbreak has spread and is spreading? Can Dr. Summers talk about the ventilation system versus social determinants of health? Is it spreading within the building? What can those people who live there do? And should they be trying to move in with family members who don't live within that building? Uh, thanks for that question. One thing I would highlight is that we do not have any evidence of uh, environmental spread throughout this building at this time. And what I mean by that is that we do not think that there's a, at this point, again, the investigation is ongoing, a structural or mechanical reason that has resulted in transmission. Where we have seen robust and rampant transmission of COVID-19 in other sectors or in other spots, it has always come down to people grouping together. Sometimes that can happen in stairwells and elevators or laundry rooms. Sometimes it happens in living rooms and dining rooms. I, it is not the current recommendation of the health unit that people who reside in this building move out and find alternative accommodation. It is our advice that they continue to remain within their apartments when they need to, go out when they have to for essential reasons, just like everybody else, and ensure that they're wearing their mask, washing their hands, and not grouping together with any others. Uh, but at this point in time, there's no mechanical or engineering uh, fault that we've identified in this instance. Thank you. And a follow up question to that one. Uh, how many people in each of the buildings are uh, have tested positive for COVID-19? We know it's 46 between the two, but Kate is asking how many in each building? Thanks for that question. It's a bit of a moving target. Uh, two thirds are in one building and a third in the other, give or take. Uh, unfortunately, Kate, off the top of my head, I can't remember which one has the proportion. So my apologies for that. All right, let's move uh, on to the next question. Uh, this is from Brent Lale, and again, this is a follow up. Um, and I think actually, Dr. Summers, you've probably addressed this. Brent was asking, should those who live in apartments now be worried about COVID transmission? I think you've mentioned that there's no mechanical uh, or, or, or physical uh, system that's been identified. So uh, no, just to monitor themselves for symptoms and keep an eye on, on that. Uh, did you have anything to add for, for Brent? Okay, then let's move to his next question, uh, and it's about the vaccine. Um, and this one, Dr. Ducalo, I think is, is probably better for you to answer. Brent is asking, has London given out all of its vaccines? And if not, do new regulations allow you to hand them all out as soon as possible? Uh, a great question, Brent. And, and no, we have not given out all of the vaccine. We continue to do that as we speak. People are being vaccinated. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, we'll ramp up to over 400 people as of tomorrow uh, per day. Um, the new regulations do help. Uh, prior to yesterday evening, we'd been restricted to only uh, giving out 50% of the vaccine we had on hand in order to save that second dose. Uh, but that, uh, that, that was changed as of last night that we can now uh, give out all of the vaccine we have in hand. We still have to pay very close attention uh, that with the incoming supply chain, there's more confidence in that now that we're still able to deliver that second dose at the approximately 20 day mark. So uh, yes, it does allow us to ramp up a little more quickly and we're doing everything we can to get shots in arms as quickly as possible. 
Thank you, Dr. Ducolo. And I'm just going to look around. We are at 2.30, but we do have another uh, five or six questions left. And are we good to continue? I'm just looking around the room. OK, so let's move on to the next. Uh, we have another question from Jennifer Beeman. And Dr. Ducolo, this one's for you. How is hospital capacity at LHSC? How many patients at Vic have been moved to other hospitals? And will this process continue into January? Great question, Jen. Um, so hospital ca capacity I would describe as OK at this point in time. We have some room in both of our intensive care units, uh, more so now at University Hospital than at Victoria Hospital. Uh, and that was the main pressure point that we were experiencing earlier last week. Um, I don't have a total number of patients that were decanted to the region up until today. It was in the low 20s as of uh, Christmas Eve. I just don't have updated numbers today. Uh, we will continue to repatriate patients, repatriation, repatriation being the term we use for patients that have come to us from, let's say, Strathroy. Once their care in London is complete, we repatriate them to Strathroy. Um, decanting patients who are from London to other regional hospitals is something that's being reconsidered uh, on a daily basis. We're very thankful to the support of our regional partners for helping us do that. Uh, but given the UH outbreaks are now uh, finished uh, and our capacity is OK, I anticipate we will shift back to only repatriation, at least for the short term. And then we have to respond when COVID surges and recognizing we're a regional resource. Uh, so it, when, when our community partners need us, we need to be available uh, to them as well. Thank you, Dr. Ducolo. Uh, we're going to move to uh, Dr. Summers now. And this is another question from Kate Dubinsky at CBC London. Uh, Dr. Summers, there are no appointments at the Carling Assessment Center until Friday, uh, yet you're asking people in the apartment buildings, and I'm sure others, to go get tested. As the second wave doesn't appear to be waning, how worried are you by the small number of testing appointments available and about the strain on contact tracers? Thanks, Kate. As uh, we've talked about before, um, the MLHU uh, does not specifically operate um, these assessment centers, but certainly supports the partnerships with others and other healthcare services in our community. Uh, the availability of uh, testing spots at the assessment center did dip through the holiday season, uh, but will be ramping back up uh, imminently. And certainly we have seen uh, testing capacity stretched um, as the second wave has increased. This is why um, my initial guidance to anybody with symptoms was not first to get tested, but first to isolate, um, regardless of whether you're going to get tested or not. It is a strain, and I think that's important to acknowledge it. Um, the healthcare partners who have been running our assessment centers have been absolutely amazing in ensuring capacity for what is now 11 months worth of testing in our community. But as the cases rise to levels that we have not yet seen, uh, capacity for testing at the assessment centers may feel a bit stretched. Again, we will see capacity ramping back up again imminently. That, however, is why it's so critical that people isolate as quickly as possible when they do develop symptoms and when they don't, of course, follow the regulations around physical distancing and masking. So yes, we will see increased capacity again in the assessment centers as the new year unfolds. It still may feel stretched, and that's why people must isolate immediately when they have symptoms. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Summers. And again, just looking at today's data, uh, it has been 285 days that the Carling Heights Optimist Community Center Assessment Center has been in operation, and 208 days for the Oak Ridge Arena Assessment Center. And uh, again, the numbers at Carling overall, they've seen almost 80,000 clients, uh, 78,205, and more than 50,000 at Oak Ridge Arena. So uh, an incredible amount of work being done there by the staff at the assessment centers uh, as well. All right, one more question in the queue. Dr. Summers, this one is for you, and it's a final question from Jen Beeman. Uh, Dr. Summers, do the multiple outbreaks in long-term care and retirement homes involve mostly staff or residents? How is the health unit supporting these homes? Thanks for that question, Jen. Uh, generally speaking, the uh, smaller outbreaks typically involve primarily staff. Um, however, if they grow in number, that's when resident numbers start to increase. So it depends on the size, it depends on the home, but generally speaking, it may start with staff, 
and then evolve to include residents. The health unit supports homes and facilities in outbreak uh, in a similar manner to which we support acute care facilities like LHSC as well. It is through meeting regularly and daily uh, with staff and administrators at these facilities to review evidence of transmission within the homes and what appropriate outbreak measures look like and how well they can be implemented. Often we find, um, especially now that facilities are aware of what is needing to be done, we support them with tricks and tips for how to do it. Um, and we ensure that additional supports, uh, if required, can be facilitated. Things like outbreak measures include uh, enhanced precautions, enhanced cleaning, changes to visitor policies, uh, changes to admissions and discharges. These types of precautions uh, tend to uh, assist with bringing these outbreaks under control. We have supported many homes throughout uh, the uh, outbreak and the pandemic season. Uh, but what I think is important to emphasize is that the amazing success that we've had through the second wave in the big scheme of things with regards to outbreaks in long-term care homes and retirement homes is primarily the hard work of the staff and the families in those facilities. And for that, we are so thankful and certainly deserve our kudos. Thank you very much, Dr. Summers. Dr. Ducolo, Mayor Holder, and Warden Burkhart Jess, and that brings us to the end of our questions for today. We appreciate the overtime as we look forward to uh, Canada, Switzerland uh, at the World Junior Hockey Championships later on today. That will take care of us for us this afternoon. We will be back with our regularly scheduled virtual media briefings on Monday, January the 4th, 2021. Between now, now and then, have a happy and safe New Year celebration and we look forward to seeing you in 2021. So long.